Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Uh, all right, everybody, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for our third half hour. Um, so, um, just to kind of recap the intro briefly, because uh, a couple of you have been in, uh, around for a few sessions, but uh, my name's Dave Rural. Uh, this is Steve Moretzky and Juan Grill. Uh, we have been doing an annual series of lectures at Casual Connect and at various of the GDCs talking about design trends in different parts of the free-to-play world, beginning on Facebook and sort of moving into broader free-to-play markets. Um, this year is an experiment. We uh, worked with the Casual Connect organizers to pull this together as a series of roundtables. Uh, hopefully you guys have uh, experienced roundtables before. They're just kind of group discussions uh, rather than just hearing us stand up front and talk about our opinions and observations. We're really interested in sort of getting the collective wisdom of the group around these kinds of games, categories, and trends. Uh, so hopefully you're here to talk. Uh, when you do talk, please use one of the microphones that are out on the tables. Um, that way we can pick you up on video and please make sure to introduce yourself uh, before the first time you speak. Um, so for the next 25 minutes or so, we're gonna be talking about developments in the last 12 months in the mid-core mobile segment. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many folks in this room have been working on a mid-core game sometime in the last year? All right, cool. Um, and how many people have been playing some mid-core games over the last year? How many people were really tired and just needed a place to sit down for a while? Okay, just double checking. Um, so, you know, I prepared a, a list of topics that we can go through and, and chew through, but we also wanna hear what you guys wanna talk about, so. I'll throw out kind of one observation I had over the last year, that there are a couple of genres that have emerged really strongly in the top grossing charts that basically didn't exist a year ago or were, you know, had maybe one game of presence, right? So these are things like uh, fighting games, right? Sports games have come up. Uh, there's a significant increase in shooters of various styles in the top 100 grossing. And I wonder what do people think is causing those things to emerge now, right? Is this change in player behavior, change in technology? Thoughts? So uh, I wonder, has anyone played Marvel Contest of Champions? Yeah. Anybody working on that game currently? All right. So, uh, Clearly, it looks like a lot of energy went in from the developer to creating a really like robust representational comic experience, right? The, the modeling looks great, the lighting looks fantastic, the deformable terrain breaking apart, and because you're here, Greg, I'll say the audio is pretty good too, right? Um, is this a game that's you know, kind of enabled by the latest mobile tech, or is this a game that could have been done a couple of years ago? Anybody? Hi, I'm Chris. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Booms App, um, and we do mid-core development. And I think one of the changes has actually been from a, a not from a design perspective or a technology perspective, but from a financing perspective. Um, if we look at the, you know, we just had a whole session about uh, progression-based puzzle games. And the problem is there's, what, 18 gajillion of those released every opposite Thursday. The, being discovered in doing that has become near impossible. And I think there has been a feeling among some of the developers that are capable of doing mid-core games that have a slightly larger team or slightly more experience than the average garage studio that maybe one of the ways they can rise above that chaff and, and have their game be noticed is to go for a mid-core audience that might be a little more dedicated to the kind of game that they're building as opposed to an extremely disposable casual audience from the puzzle games. So to answer your question as to why are we seeing these kind of games coming out right now, 
I actually think it's, uh, it's certainly the case for my studio uh, that it's a case of desperation where we know that we could make lots of these disposable casual games, match threes and whatnot, uh, but we also know that they're going to fail. Uh, you know, the, the chances are almost certain that they're going to fail without huge funding in marketing and distribution. So if we look at how that game is going to be advertised, we've seen the rise of the YouTubers, we've seen the rise of the Let's Plays, we've seen the rise of uh, Virality as the premium marketing channel. Well, you're not really going to do a, a Let's Play video for Candy Crush. It doesn't make much sense. What, what am I watching? But a mid-core game, there's, there's actually some meat for somebody to get a hold of and do a Let's Play video or to do a Wikipedia page or something that would actually tie down an audience and get them involved in the game. So I, when you ask why, is, why are mid-core games uh, coming out with new designs and that sort of thing, I, th for my studio, that's certainly the case because we can't afford to go out and do Zynga style or, or even Big Fish style marketing campaigns with huge user acquisition budgets it's just not an option for a lot of studios. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, very much so. So, um, Greg Ron from uh, Kabam, um, audio director there, and uh, actually I came to listen to Dave talk and Steve and Juan and and uh, I'm sure we'll get a lot more of your guys' great, uh, great <laughs> stuff. But uh, I'm happy to chime in here. Um, uh, Contest of Champions was done by Exploding Barrel Games, which is in Vancouver, which Kabam purchased. So they're part of Kabam now. Um, and so I don't really have a close uh, look at the tech, right? I've, I've, I understand it. I know what they're using. Um, but I can say that to answer the tech part of the question, yes, there's a lot of propri proprietary tech there. To, to make the, all those graphics and things look so good and make the gameplay work. Um, my involvement was on the audio soundtrack side of things. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, I can I can speak to that part of it. That was that was done, um, you know, with a full orchestra. I used a live orchestra for that. And, uh, but content wise, it wasn't a huge endeavor as far as minutes of music. So we probably had four minutes, five minutes total music in the whole game. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's one of the things I want to improve and expand on, but we had to get the thing to market, and, uh, and that's what we ended up with. Um, so um, from a tech standpoint, I guess the part of your question I can answer is that, yes, there's some proprietary tech there uh, that they've developed over a period of time. And they use it in their Fast and Furious game, and they used it then, uh, they keep improving it and use it in Marvel as well. So uh, one thing I'd love to, to get a take on, coming back to, to Chris's comments, he was saying that he feels like it's a little easier to, uh, to kind of stand out, to be found, to be visualized as a, a mid-core game. It's actually a pretty crowded market. This screen is, is cutting off here, but I did just a quick grab of the U.S. top 100 grossing on iOS and pulled out everything that could conceivably be thrown into the mid-core category. So stuff that's a little more male marketed, a little more conflict oriented. I threw Fallout Shelter in there, which is kind of a marginal call. It's a, a casual mechanic on a more core theme. Um, 33 of the top 100 grossing, right, are mid-core games. So it's a really, really competitive feel. Um, what do you guys think about Chris's thesis that it is, you know, kind of easier to stand out, easier to be differentiated than doing yet another Saga-style puzzle game? Uh, there might be an on switch on the bottom. Here. Got it, got it. Uh, Jefferson Valadar is a... Um, GM for mobile for Bandai Namco in the US. Um, so I think, I'm not sure it's easier to be found, but I think it's easier to be successful because like mid-core game, generally you need less people like uh, to be successful, right? Like you can have like a smaller audience. So like a, you, probably that side I think is true, but I think it's still pretty hard to be found, doesn't matter. I mean, um, if you're trying something that doesn't have any previous history, uh, it's still pretty hard. 
to defend my thesis for a moment, uh, one, one big thing is when we sent out uh, media press kits and such to YouTubers and to, uh, we, we also did a match three game, uh, Rescue Quest, which was a, a you know, very straightforward uh, a level progression match three game. We couldn't get anyone interested in writing anything about that because they were like, dude, it's another match three. We've, we've, we've gotten 20 of those this week where when we sent out stuff for Super Awesome Quest, which was a mid-core sort of RPG title, uh, mm -hmm. we had a lot of people interested in covering that just because there's a lot more street cred to the media who cover that as well as the YouTubers. The, the other thing I would say is um, while you do have a lot of data that said looking in the top 100 for, you know, look, 33 of these are, are mid-core titles, if we were to expand out our search to the top 1,000 titles, there's just a huge weight of chaff of small, simple, garage-based puzzle games that people have done, whether they're match three or other small, uh, largely disposable titles. And you know, you're not just going out and competing with the top 100, you're competing with every single game on there to, to get anyone to notice I, I you. Think, I think we're missing the, uh, one important point, which is uh, the reason why you're doing the strategy that you're doing is because your gamers actually read media about games. Versus I, I, I everybody really else. They watch YouTube about games. It's well, weird. that's weird that's 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 why I say consume yeah. media. That's why I say consume media. Yeah, not read. Uh, re, the, the, you're absolutely right. Consume yeah. media. Let's yeah. use the word consume media. So they actually they actually consume media about games versus everybody else. They don't. So, but it seems to me that that player not only consumes media about games, they also want to be part of a community. Yeah. So the question then is. Would, uh, um, uh, would a mid-core game w work if it doesn't have the guilds, the community elements uh, that uh, most mid-core games have? Okay. Still on. Uh, my name is Chetan Madipadla. I'm director of product at Electronic Arts uh, Mobile. Um, uh, so I think your point is is a good one. Uh, uh, well, I wanted to actually also talk about the role of brand in, mm -hmm. in games. So yeah. as, as a way to differentiate uh, from the the clutter of games, and obviously Contest of Champions, Leverage, Marble, but I think the larger players are not only looking at the you know bigger presentation value and production value and investing more in the teams and the talent, but the brand is a big component of that. And uh, you know their games in you know obviously top of the list Clash of Clans that has become a brand, but um, at the time when it launched there wasn't as much competition so they could actually build up to that point, but now in this crowded market if you want to get that early acquisition of users that make or break the game and also you know the press is everyone's interested at game launch, you need to be able to make that big boom up front, mm -hmm. and that's where brands are a big component. Well, and also is uh, it came up during the social casino panel earlier. Um, having a recognizable brand can significantly impact your cost of acquisition, yeah. right, on a rolling basis. So uh, I know in my, my travels I've seen very meaningful effects from that, right. Um, other thoughts? I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, how do people see arcade games on, mo on, on, on mobile? Are those part of mid-core or part of, uh, uh, are they the same audience that is playing Clash of Clans, let's say, just curious about Pac-Man uh, Deluxe, uh, do you, just, you guys yeah. just released that. Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that a crossover with people who are playing uh, mid -core games? It's a really interesting question because I think a lot of people assume Pac-Man is a casual game. Uh, we get, so I get somebody right. yesterday who was saying, oh, you got Pac-Man, pa casual game, right? I'm like, it's <laughs> no, not right. a casual That's exactly game. Right. Yeah. A game uh -huh. where you die every 10 seconds is not casual. Uh, right. So they <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a weird, like I think the arcade stuff is a weird thing because they, it's, I would say it's more like a core, traditional core audience, because they, right. they like the difficulty. They like the, like, actually, if it's too easy, they, they complain, right? So they really yeah. like the challenge part right. of it. Uh, so it's, it's skew based, I think, probably, like, if you're yeah. going to say something around it, probably, like, skew based game. Yeah. No, and I, and I think uh, that's also par part of uh, the how the stores are treating arcade games, because they're putting games that Ketchup makes, with a one tap game, next to Pac Man. Right, Re uh, and 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 uh, or shooting stars, which is this uh, beautiful shoot 'em up that uh, was released by New Look Studios a couple of weeks ago, and that's where I get confused. It's like, 
who, who, uh, uh, the, it seems that they're grouping on arcade two completely different audiences, right? I would argue that I mean, a, a really good example of this would be Crossy Road, right? Is, is that a casual game or is it not a, or, you know, that, that's, a, like you say, it's a game where you die every 10 seconds, right? And there, there's a whole classification of these kind of games, um, uh, One More Dash or One More Line or, or, or these titles which are endless skill-based, often die games. And I think that game has a very different audience than, say, a Candy Crush or, or a Gummy Drop. I think th you're, you're talking about uh, a very different user dynamic there. But I think those games also have a very different user dynamic from, uh, say, a Clash of Clans or a, a Boom Beach, or I'm, I'm just looking down the list of the top Android uh, mid-core games. So I'm not sure I would say Pac-Man is a mid-core game because I think you're targeting a different, you're, you're targeting a different uh, goal for the user of what they're doing with it, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play uh, Clash of Clans sitting on my couch and I'm going to spend some time with it um, I'm going to play Crossy Road while I'm on the toilet for you know 20 seconds, and I think those are very different experiences. But I think either one of those is a different experience from uh, the the core design loop of a, a what we would call a casual game, a, a low stress casual game. I think core and casual is really a spectrum. It's not you know you're w in one or the other, and and I kind of think of casual as sort of a checklist of 10 things or so, and, and you know is the onboarding ramp really easy? You know, is, is the rule set small? You know, is it familiar or playtime short? Things like that. There are a lot of different characteristics of, of a casual game, and I think Pac-Man probably checks, you know, say eight or nine out of the 10. Um, and, um, you know, I would say it, it checks enough of them that, you know, if I had to pick one, one side of the divide or the other, I would put it on the casual side. So, oh. Uh, yeah, can you pass the mic over? So I just wanted to say yeah. I'm with EA now. Previously it was Gree and DNA, and I was mostly in publishing uh, for those two last companies. And so mid-core is not necessarily a look or feel of the game. It's more like a core game mechanic. And a lot of companies failing is that bringing or merging kind of a casual look of the game with mid-core mechanic inside of the game and then having a wider audience. And I think like Knights and Dragons from Gree is one of the good examples that they achieved that goal. And so that's part of the reason like I feel like, you know, there are so many games out there that look like a casual arcade type of games, but their goal actually is to monetize the user using a new core game mechanic. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the you know, the Supercell RTS games are a big testament to that kind of, you know, art direction and visual design sensibility, right? They're bright, they're cartoony, they're, you know, um, easily, you know, easy to connect with, easy to relate to, um, rather than being sort of gritty, representational, realistic. Um, and that's certainly a big design trend. We've seen a lot of, of high-grossing mid-core games Anybody here from Machine Zone? No? All right, good. Nobody will punch me in the head afterwards. Uh, has anybody here played Game of War? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Only a couple? No, only I did, but I forced my whole team to play it. There you go. <laughs> so one of the things that you may have noticed when you played Game of War is that it's hard to actually see the game on the game screen because of all the flashing monetization prompts. Yeah, and by the way, it looks way better now. Like, I remember I saw somebody presented me the other day and like the, it actually looks almost like a game now, but like, maybe like if you, when it launched, like it looked pretty rough. But, uh, well, uh, pretty not only rough in terms of, of Asakwa, but you know, I was, I was sort of playing it for uh, research uh, a month or two ago. And you know, literally it was just festooned with monetization prompts all over the main screen. Uh, it monetizes on at least eight or nine distinct vectors I was able to enumerate, because I was doing a monetization study. Um, it does a bunch of stuff that almost any of us would be embarrassed to do and makes a ridiculous amount of money. So I'm wondering, are they wrong or are we wrong? I'm not gonna answer it. I just asked the questions here. <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, I think nobody's wrong. I think you've reached a, a core part 
of what a mid-core game is, which is it's a specialized audience, right? Um, where if I'm making a, a brand new Candy Crush, the only way it works is if everyone and their dog plays it. But if I can find the exact user that's cool with this proposition, he's gonna stay with me a long time. And I don't have to worry about, oh, only 2% of my game actually ever gives me any money. We, we have a, a, a larger percentage of our game that's going to give us some money and they're gonna do it over a longer period of time. And we can make very different value propositions based on specific subsets of our audience that can be smaller and more niche. So I wouldn't say they're doing it wrong. They're obviously making a great deal of money doing it, but I would be very hesitant to say like, ah, they're doing it right and we should take all of our other games and do what they're doing because I think you're gonna fuck up that audience because that audience has chosen this particular game because that's the game that, that works for them. And I think this, when we say what is a mid-core game, to me that's sort of the heart of a mid-core game is it's a much more specialized audience. Uh, to just build off of that, um, I agree with a lot of that, but and maybe this is a remnant of them churning through a lot of their uh, early users who were more core, but their marketing strategy is completely the opposite now, right? I mean, with advertising with Kate Upton in Super Bowl, going mass media, um, just trying to reach out as much of an audience as possible, and then, you know, maybe some of them will result in their core audience, but uh, maybe it'd be great, oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, I think that, that you're both kind of poking on the same thing, which is if you, you know, if you look at typical user trajectories in a casual game, you're looking at a, a very wide top of the funnel, and then you're kind of desperately trying to stabilize at day three plus, right, to retain those users. Uh, whereas the more core your game is, the sharper that drop at the top of the funnel is. Right, but then generally the more linear, once you hit day three or day seven, that user's really locked in and you've kind of um, done your chaffing very early and aggressively. And so those are really, really different curves that you know, I know I've needed to adjust to as I've moved categories and products. Yeah, actually like one of the things that called my attention to Clash of Clans uh, in the beginning was, uh, I think it was the first game that did, it had a kind of casual retention curve, but, but, like, but with like a monetization from a core game. I think that was the first game I saw that had like, a lot of people play the game, stay around, and they spend a decent amount of money. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. not you know, in the sense, it's in the tens of cents, right? Like compared to most traditional like casual games, but it still has like 47% day one, and kind of like drops off very little afterwards. So they, they that, that was kind of like the, I guess the magic for the game, was that to be able to combine the two facets of Retention mm -hmm. with um, Dave, I think uh, in response to your question, are they wrong or are we wrong? I think this kind of speaks to uh, the need for adaptation. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in this space, I think we have to adapt faster more than any other platform that's ever come before. And I had heard that they, they attracted so many users with Kate Upton that they actually had to put her in the game because players were coming to the game to find her and she wasn't there. So it seems to me they're just figuring it out as they go and they're adapting as they have to and mm -hmm. pushing, all the, pushing all the boundaries. I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to, to heavily agree with that and, and, and say that I think one of our big problems as game developers is that we'll look at a chart like this and we'll say like, hey look, Clash of Clans is still right at the top. You know, we should, we should really study Clash of Clans and we forget a lot of the riots there is historical reasons, right? There are people who have been investing in this game for so long that pulling them out of that experience is just a four score bitch, right? Mm -hmm. But there have been games that have come along since then that do this entirely differently that have gone and developed an entirely different user base. So the one that jumps out obviously is Hearthstone, right? Mm -hmm. The monetization, the core game loop, everything about Hearthstone is radically different than Clash of Clans, but it has been very, very successful from doing something entirely new. And so I think while we can be introspective about what has been successful in the past and go look at that, I'm very leery of saying, is Game of War right or wrong or is mm -hmm. Hearthstone right or wrong? Because the, the big successes that we've seen since Clash of Clans have largely not duplicated that effort, right? They've not duplicated that exact monetization, not the big breakout hits. 
Um, and I, I think we, we mislead ourselves mm -hmm. because there is that huge history for some of these titles. Candy Crush is another great one, right? There are people that have invested years and you know, hundreds of dollars or more into these titles. They're not doing that because this is the best way to do it. They're doing that because they've got that history. Yep. So it's about 2.26. Uh, there are plenty of things that we didn't get to get to around social structures and community management, uh, you know, sort of uh, driving people in those social structures, the missing chinks in the genre list, and, you know, what will it ever take for a MOBA to succeed on, on mobile, which is, I think, a super interesting question. Uh, one of the things we're doing with each of these roundtables is if folks are enjoying the discussions, uh, please drop a card. Uh, we're going to start up some mailing lists afterwards so that after Casual Connect, we can continue uh, rolling forward and discussing some related topics. Um, we want to thank you for coming. You've got about three minutes to get to your next session. And in about three minutes here in this room, we will be continuing our, our last roundtable, which is going to cover general market trends and genres we didn't get to until now. So we'll hope to see you then. Thanks.